We've got an all-star lineup this morning, this afternoon. I'm working on a different time zone, obviously. Um, I'm, you've got before you, you should have the agenda. And we're going to hear first and foremost from Henry Neufeld, who is the head of climate change research at the World Agroforestry Center. Then we're going to hear, and I'm just going to go ahead and introduce people, um, Maria Lisa Tapio Bistrom, who is a senior officer for climate change at the Food and Agriculture Organization. Dr. Esther Magambo, who is a coordinator for Climate Change Unit with the Ministry of Agriculture in Kenya. Followed by Esther will be Anne Hanele Tanenen, who is the counselor for natural resources and energy with the Embassy of Finland here in Pretoria. And then we will hear from Bernard Giro, the Vice President for Sustainability and Shared Value Creation with Danone. Access to knowledge and training. The only, the one that I highlighted in yellow, that's the only system that we looked at in a, in a project in Western Kenya where um, we assessed how their art training was taken up by farmers. It does not show a difference from the farmers that were trained versus those that weren't trained in the number of trees that were planted for timber, for fodder, for soil fertility, or for medicinal. All these systems show that by training, farmers are more open to uptake. And finally, insecure tenure. This is, uh, I don't want to go into how these numbers were derived, but it shows clearly that um, where t tenure is secure, um, Bennett returns to land are threefold in Kenya to those that have a non-secure tenure. The, those with secure tenure, they have uh, six times more uh, tree crops per hectare, they have more woodlots, and they more have more hedgerows uh, by a number of factors. So the key recommendations that I want to draw out of this. First of all, we need to make the connection between national and local levels, provide an enabling legal and political environment. Secondly, we need to improve the market accessibility for these farmers so that they can sell their products. If they do not have access to the markets, then they can produce only for themselves, which is not sufficient. Um, we need to involve the farmers early in the project planning process so that we make sure that we're really producing for them. Improve access to knowledge and training, I just showed that. Um, if we bring farmers from one place where we have been successful and show them how things work, farmers will pick it up more easily if they see that it can be done. Um, we have to introduce more secure tenure. This has an extremely important effect. And any climate finance project is virtually impossible without secure tenure. We have to overcome the barriers of high opportunity costs to land. I've shown you that. and. For instance, Plan Vivo offers ex-ante ex payments. And they might allow uh, these opportunity costs to be overcome. On the other hand, they are having major difficulties of selling their uh, carbon credits on the markets. And finally, we need to improve access to farm implements and capital. This also includes insurance systems that will uh, provide farmers with the flexibility to be reacting more flexibly and more uh, and increase their adaptive capacities to climate shocks. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Henry. Thanks for setting the stage and showing us that there are not a lot of practices that are being considered in terms of climate smart agriculture. And uh, what we what we want to do now is to hear from a group of people that have come at this from different perspectives. They've uh, invested time, energy, and financial resources, and we'd like to hear about how they're addressing uh, climate smart agriculture as it pertains to the poor, and the constraints and insights they'd like to share. So I turn it over to Maria Lisa Tapio Bistro with the FAO. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for inviting us for this discussion. I will share some insights on the relationship between uh, agriculture, food security, and climate change. And 
For that, we have developed and are developing the concept of climate smart agriculture. To set the scene, we have two goals of our time. We need to achieve food security. We have until now miserably failed in that. We have about one billion hungry. We know that the population is going to increase. FAO is saying that we should increase food production by 70% by 2050. I hope it doesn't have to be that much. I hope we can increase the efficiency of our food systems and cut the enormous waste we are at the moment having and can manage with less increase. For this, for achieving food security, Adaptation to climate change is critical. There is no farming system in the world, no intensive, no extensive, no poor or rich who can avoid the necessity to adaptation. So it's really fundamental for food security. And then we have the second challenge, avoiding dangerous climate change. We here are all painfully aware what it means for production, for food security, for our possibilities, for, for good life if we go over the two degree goal. Even two degrees will be difficult in many, many areas. So we need to be able to make major emission cuts. We also know at, that agriculture and land use sectors together are responsible to about 30% of the emissions. And land use change that's very much driven by agriculture and, and energy needs. So we believe that it's impossible to reach the goal of uh, decreasing dangerous uh, climate change if we don't include agriculture into in a big way to, to mitigation efforts. So agriculture needs to be part of the solution. Okay, and because we are where we are, I want to have one slide where I little bit reflect also the relationship of the different policy processes. We all know that at the global level, we have the different policy processes. We have the one we are here now, UNFCCC. We have the CBD, looking at the biodiversity. And we have the food security processes, looking at, at let's say, calories or, or, or food. And these, all these processes are separate, they are negotiated and by separate um, people, separate ministries, and they, little, they live quite much their own lives. When we move down, when we come to national level, we can see that there are very many uh, interactions between these different processes. And when we go to local level to farm level, we can see that they are all uh, uh, addressed by the farmers at the same time with the different decisions they make on how do they cultivate their lands. But what we want to emphasize is that it's not possible to reach these go separately. They have to go hand in hand. It's absolutely essential to increase the productivity of existing lands. It's not possible not to adapt. The, thing, the key issue is how do we do it? Do we have so-called spontaneous unplanned adaptation where farmers just try to cope? Or do we engage in systematic long-term adaptation where we help the farmers to build their resilience? 
And then we need to reduce or remove greenhouse gas emissions. And all this has to enhance achievement of national food security and development goals. Most of the world's poor people are farmers in developing countries. So it's not possible to separate climate issues from the development and poverty reduction agenda. We have to achieve the different goals at the same time with a clear priority on poverty reduction and development. Key issues on, on agriculture mitigation. It's not only about soils. Vegetation in agricultural landscapes has a very large potential. Emission reductions per produced unit will be a major contribution. Just to highlight what FAO is doing on this, we have a, a mitigation and climate change in agriculture program where we support the farmers towards making it possible to mitigate by developing emission database and life cycle analysis, analyzing the global policies, analyzing the potential of various practices, technologies and investments to enhance food security, adaptive capacity and mitigation potential. And we test all this in practice in smallholder context in, in different parts of the world. So my take home message is this. Climate change mitigation will never be the main goal of agriculture. And no farmer farms to mitigate. Mitigation is not possible without successful adaptation. Increasing productivity and carbon content on existing cultivated areas is essential. Landscape approach with a comprehensive land use planning is a must for maximum mitigation impact from land-based sectors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria Lisa. We very much appreciate what FAO is doing in a concerted effort, both at the local and at the global level, on climate smart agriculture. And now we turn our attention to Esther Magambo to hear from the Kenyan government perspective. Esther, please. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, after the two presentations have been done, uh, my task is going to let you know uh, what our perspective of climate smart agriculture. This has generated a lot of debate and in some cases some misunderstanding. So I'll, like, I'll, I'll take uh, the next few minutes to let you know how we appreciate this. And of course, briefly say, we, uh, talk about the environment within which we are doing this. So I'll do a very quick introduction so that you understand uh, what our sector is. Uh, our ours is an agriculture-based economy, so this is uh, the sector for that uh, is a basis for our development, sustainable development. And 80% uh, of our population, uh, which is over 40 million, depends on agriculture. And only 20% of uh, our land is medium to high potential, and only 2% is irrigated. And therefore, you appreciate what this means for us in the face of climate change. We have a conducive legal environment in Kenya as far as climate change is concerned. In our vision 2030, which is a country's blueprint for development, we have uh, specific uh, pillars, uh, flagships uh, that are specific in agriculture where we are anchoring climate change concerns. Further, within the agriculture sector, we have the agriculture sector development strategy that runs from last year to 2020, that was uh, endorsed by 10 agriculture ministries within, of course, the wider uh, taking into account the national climate change response strategy, which is guiding our interventions on climate change in the country. Uh, further to this, we have uh, the Comprehensive Ac Africa Agriculture Development Program, and Kenya uh, signed its compact uh, last year, Candid Compact, last year, and the essence of this is to commit 10% of the budget to at least get uh, about 6% growth in the sector as per the Maputo Declaration. And the National Climate Change Response Strategy takes into account all the sectors and we have developed a quick start project 
to the specific one start to the specific mitigation and the uh, adaptation actions in agriculture contained in this strategy. So this is uh, our legal base, and uh, institutionally we have uh, a very specific dedicated unit in the ministry that coordinates all climate change activities, whose overall objective is to mainstream climate change adaptation and mitigation in all agricultural programs, projects, and activities. Now, uh, the focus of the uh, side event is on climate smart agriculture, and I said I'm going to give you our understanding of this. And uh, you've been given the, the definitions by the organization that came up with this term that uh, we understand to entail production systems that combine three aspects of increased productivity that gives the farmers the food security and the incomes of course and climate resilience through various adaptation strategies and carbon sequestration or avoided emissions in the production sector. This is very important for us and this is our priorities go as far as uh, our approach to this is concerned because the farmer what they value is the food in the store or the money in their pocket and as has just been said by the earlier speaker farmers are not going to to do mitigation for mitigation it is they produce then in the process you support them to have resilient systems and then contribute to addressing climate change and therefore this essentially for us means that farmers are getting better returns from increased yields on a sustained basis and further, they contribute to mitigating climate change through the carbon sequester through their production systems or avoided emissions. And therefore, adapting to climate change means to increase productivity, resilience, and mitigation. And this is what we refer to as climate smart agriculture. And we further uh, note that the farmers, uh, farmer does not have to make any conscious effort to sequester the carbon, for example, but rather it's a byproduct of the sustainable land management practices that the farmers employ to realize the high yields on a sustained basis in the face of climate change. So farmers are meeting their needs, but in the process you, uh, you educate them, avail to them the technology, the practices that are going to put them on a path where they increase their yields, they have sustainable production systems, and at the same time contribute to reducing emissions. Therefore, there's nothing new we are really introducing as far as we are concerned uh, with the concept of uh, the, cons uh, we call it CSA, a climate smart agriculture, but rather uh, it brings out some hidden value in these sustainable agricultural production systems and that is uh, that carbon that we didn't talk about. And therefore we have a few planned interventions. We plan to work with the World Bank to give us, support us in developing mechanisms for climate smart agriculture and we also are plan to collaborate with the US government in supporting us on our low emission development strategy in agriculture and uh, this is basically to roll out our priorities in the as per the national climate change response strategy which have already been identified we have a number of ongoing activities in a way in way of our, we have a project by GIZ that's looking at uh, reducing vulnerabilities and weather index insurance and promotion of various practices that Andy already talked about, uh, some of which Andy already talked about, so I'm not going to dwell on this. And uh, what is important to note is that we have a few challenges in this. Uh, we still have a few conflicts here and there in provisions of various pieces of registration. The cost of farm inputs, farm credit, uh, access to planting materials and how to combine these production systems. For example, how do we combine crop and livestock enterprises in conservation agriculture, for example. And the whole concept of measurements. How do we measure soil carbon in conservation agriculture and other other practices? And I'll conclude by saying since the poor are the ones that are predominantly engaged in agriculture, we need to have climate resilient agricultural investments. And uh, in addressing that, the, the food security, which is our goal, is need to pro, uh, promote those sustainable land management practices. And finally, I wish again to underscore the fact that in embracing uh, climate smart agriculture, 
the, our order of priorities is very clear. It is increased productivity, resilience, and mitigation as a core benefit. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Esther. That was an excellent presentation. We really appreciate the fact that um, Kenya is, is really building on what's working already as it moves into a climate smart agriculture and also for laying out some of the issues and constraints that have been faced as you've put this process in place. So at this point, I'd like to turn now to another vantage point, and that is from Anne Tane Tarvenian, apologies, um, with the Finnish government to talk about some of the work they're doing. They've been investing in climate smart agriculture. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me to present the uh, Embassy of Finland or Finnish Foreign Ministry in this, in this event. I would like to speak a little bit what Finland is doing on the climate smart agriculture. As we all know, the effects of the climate change on agricultural production and rural populations are become, becoming more and more evident, particularly in, in developing countries. This is the reason why rural development, food security and the climate change are the priorities in the Finnish development policy. Climate smart agriculture practices play a gen gen central role in the nexus of food security and the climate change. In our development policy, climate change is taken into consideration in all development work known as climate proofing. Furthermore, Finland's development cooperation must be climate friendly in the long term objectives is being a carbon neutral. The eradication of poverty and the climate change mitigation and adaptation are complementary issues uh, in developing countries and cannot be viewed as a separate entities. That's why Finland supports the adaptation of the poorest and most vulnerable countries in the adverse Im impact of the climate change, as well as the participation of developing countries in the climate change negotiation processes. A special emphasis is placed on equality and the promotion of the status of women, both at the local level and international climate policy. As we all know, most of the food production in developing countries is still undertaken by smallhold farmers. Therefore, Finland is allocates its aid primary to them. Particularly, attention is focused on women farmers. Almost all food production in, and processing in the developing countries is done by women at the household level. Finland's history on enhancing in inclusion of gender in climate change-related activities is well known. Why do we support gender-sensitive approach? The, uh, the rationale is twofold. Firstly, the impact of the climate change and also biodiversity loss will hit women hardest in developing countries. Due to various economic and social roles, women in developing countries are largely responsible for securing food, water, energy, energy for cooking and heating. Climate change, including drought, desertification and erratic rainfall, result in women having to work even harder to secure these resources. Secondly, and even more importantly, while women's role and responsibilities in households, communities, and as a stewards of natural resources make them especially vulnerable, it also makes them powerful agents force of change. Women are well positioned, positioned to develop, de develop strategies for adapting and changing environmental realities. Given these realities, Finland finds to be, to be of critical importance to strengthen women's capacity and encourage them to engage in the decision making throughout the full spectrum of environmental issues. We believe that it is not enough that only one half of the world's population would be able to take care of environmental problems. Without inclusion, we will fail. Finland assists the partner countries in creating and implementing climate change adaptation strategies and low carbon development plans. We want to emphasize the importance link from the household level agriculture to all the way to these international negotiation tables. Uh, the enabling environment to practice climate smart agriculture must be ensured at all levels, internationally, nationally, regionally and at the household level. Smallhold small warm farmers need institutional and financial support for the transition. Governments and civil servants 
must have the knowledge and the tools to support them, while the global coordination between international organizations is needed. Mutual commitment for climate smart agriculture is needed at all levels, as I mentioned. If there, there is a will, there is a way. But we also need the concrete results results from climate smart agriculture to support decision makers to make this happen. Uh, as mentioned at Maria Lisa's presentation, there is a um, mitigation of climate change in agriculture pro project called MICA, which is uh, supported by Finland, Norway and Germany. Uh, this project promotes climate smart agriculture and reduces emission from agriculture. This is achieved in this project by reducing better data and knowledge on the emissions, mitigation potential and food farming practices. At the national and local level, this is done by building the capacity of mitigation in agriculture. The project has produced guidelines in co in for co incorporating gender in the climate change project in the smallholder agriculture. An important activity is also production of concrete evidence from the pilot project in various smallholder production systems. The pilot projects are implemented together with ICRAF, who is doing the measurements of greenhouse gas has gas emissions. We are happy to, to invite also the other donors to join the financing of the MICA. Let me con conclude by emphasizing the importance of making climate smart agriculture to work for the poor and especially for the poor women. We give a, give a high five value for the work of FAO, ICRAF and CER Institute as well as the international and national organizations which are working to get the climate smart agriculture methods as a common practice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna, and thank you very much for bringing in the gender perspective and underscoring that very well, and also the issue of evidence. We're calling a lot of practices climate smart, and we do need the evidence to show that this is real. At this point, I'd like to uh, turn our attention to um, the words of Bernard uh, Giro, who is with Danon, and he's going to tell us about the, um, the new livelihoods venture. Thank you very much. Um, uh, well, the good news is that you will not have slides, so it's good for your eyes. I think it's a rest. <coughs> well, uh, thank you for inviting me as a representative uh, from the private sector. I work uh, with Danone, uh, a large food company that's the number one in fresh dairy product worldwide and the number two in bottled water in the world and also in uh, baby nutrition. The initiative I will talk about is called Livelihoods, Livelihoods Fund. In fact, it's not an initiative by Danone only. Danone has been joined recently by other companies. The concept is quite simple. It's the fact that our large companies produce a lot of emission. In the case of Danone, it's about 7 million tons per year. And we have taken the commitment in 2008 to reduce by 30%, 3-0, in four years the global emission of our companies. But at the end of the, of the day, when we will have succeeded, and we will succeed to reduce by 30% in four years, we still have 70%. And we are growing. So we decided to go on two legs. One is reduction, the second one is offset. And how could we do that without just buying carbon credits? It was not really our vision, our mindset. We decided to be partners in uh, investing in area where uh, there is a link with our activities. In the case of Danone, it is agriculture. So how can we bridge the fact that on the one hand, smart agriculture will provide better revenue, reduction of poverty for smallholders, and on the other hand, uh, providing carbon credit for offsetting the emission of our large uh, companies' activities. So this is exactly the fundamentals of the Livelihoods Fund. It's a win-win approach. On the one hand, it's a real investment fund, meaning that when a company like Danone invests several millions of euros in this fund, it takes a risk. The risk is that the money doesn't come back under the form of credit, ca carbon credit if the project fails. But it will generate as well 
a lot of social and environmental value uh, with the community. So far, five large projects have been uh, invested by uh, Livelihoods Fund with the support of Danone and the other corporation. And we want to mobilize 50 million euros in the fund to generate, on the one hand, about 12 million tons of carbon credits. And of course, between five and, and ten times the value through social revenue, income for the farmers. So if I take a little bit in more details, uh, what we consider are the key criteria to invest in a project of what you call smart agriculture. I didn't know there was a, something which was not, not so smart, but okay. Um, so the first uh, criteria for us is farmers involvement. We are not planting trees. We are doing farm, sustainable farming projects. Trees and carbon are a mean, not an end. So the key success factor for us is the mobilization of the community, in particularly the, the women, by the way, which play a key role in all our projects. And it is a fact that it's not about producing carbon revenue for the farmer for the farmers. It is about generating sustainable income for the farmers. The second one is scale. The average size of our project is 6,000 hectares. Under this scale, it is very difficult to establish and monitor a carbon project. And of course, this is the same impact. The, more, the, the larger the project is, the more impact it has on the local community. Another very important point for us is the cost of the project. What is, what is in very interesting is agroforestry, and uh, we can thank uh, ICRA for uh, really uh, showing the way with those technologies, is that we can really scale a project at low cost. Agroforestry can be uh, upscale, can be replicated at very low cost. So it's more about smart agriculture in the right way, meaning that uh, know-how of farmers, uh, uh, seedlings are not uh, such a high cost and we can in, in increase uh, very rapidly uh, the, the farmer's revenue. So low-cost technology is also the right equation to fund the project for carbon, because the cost of the ton of carbon will be key in the fact that we invest or not. And if we can implement a project large scale, low cost, we can have a very significant impact. Another point is uh, pre-financing. One bottleneck today for carbon projects with uh, poor communities is the fact that there is very little pre-financing, except public funding. But public funding, with the situation we have currently, uh, particularly in Europe, but in other parts of the world, is not that easy. So how can we combine uh, funding from the public sector plus uh, smart funding through carbon offset with the private sector? Uh, and we decided when we created the Livelihoods Fund to invest upfront, meaning that we take the risk. In India, for example, in Andhra Pradesh, we, the, we are helping poor communities of uh, Adivasi to plant 6 million fruit trees, a combination of mango and other, uh, and other trees. And under the trees, under, under the shade of the trees, they develop uh, uh, coffee uh, planting. They have already uh, uh, organic certification for their coffee. They have doubled the price of the, of the coffee. And then we can uh, really upscale with, uh, with low cost. This project will generate 1 million tons of carbon credit and a lot of revenue for the farmers. And what we believe, as it was said before, is that access to market will be key. It's not just enough to plant fruit trees. Of course, from now, even though it will take a few years to have the first uh, harvest of fruits, uh, the local organization has started to think with private sector, Indian and international, on how best valorize the fruits from the trees that are planted on such a scale. Um, another thing which is uh, very important to us and will be important in the future is uh, the methodologies for carbon. And I think my colleague here 
will make a very interesting presentation on a new methodology that is being developed by our colleagues from uh, Unique Forestry, um, which is how we can uh, make the carbon methodology, uh, I would say, closer to the reality of uh, farming practices. So far, we use afforestation, reforestation methodology, which is okay for a project like those we have in Congo, in Senegal, in Indonesia, in India. But if we are able to have carbon measures that are closer to the real practices of the farmers, it will help us uh, developing new uh, high-scale project. And last but not least, I would say that for us, what is important is not the business model itself. It's not uh, the methodology. It is the people, meaning the entrepreneur. Uh, for us, one key success factor in our project is how we select the local organization. It can be a private entrepreneur, it can be an NGO, whatever the legal status is. But what is important is the quality of the entrepreneur, its capacity to mobilize thousands of farmers, small scale, but to reach high scale projects. So it is a, a real specificity. There are not so many organizations that are able to do that. And this uh, quality is, uh, is a key success factor for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bernard. We really appreciate hearing about the commitment that Danone has made and also the willingness to take on the issue of incentives and scale simultaneously with the people at the front. Thank you very much. And now we turn our attention, you've already had one segue, I believe, from Bernard, Amos. Um, but Amos Waseka is going to speak to us from the perspective of what they've been able to cause to happen on the ground through the VI Agroforestry work. Amos, please. Yes, uh, I work for the Agroforest, which is a Swedish NGO working in Eastern in, in East Africa, and we have a unique project called Kenya Agricultural Carbon Project. And uh, as you know, the characteristics of uh, Kenya or Western Kenya, as other sub-Saharan areas, you will find that there are major issues like water, uh, water crisis. There is uh, food crisis. There is energy crisis. And uh, those who are suffering are smallholder farmers. Like uh, we have some data here, like 50% of smallholders live less than one dollar per day, and uh, they use 90% of their energy. They, they depend on firewood or charcoal, and uh, uh, around 25% of children under five years are underweight, and the population growth in Western Kenya is around three three percent and 80% of the population are 80. So when you look at the economic development, the social and equity and the environmental sustainability, there are problems around this area because of the, the problems farmers have. So this project uh, is unique. It has a feature of win-win-win scenario where uh, we are learning that uh, the project is an evident that mitigation finance provides significant uh, incentive to leverage agricultural investments that generate productivity increases and uh, re reduction and removal of greenhouse gases and also increased climate resilience. That's what we are learning from smallholder farmers. And uh, a Kenya Agricultural Carbon Project vis a vis climate smart agriculture. Uh, it has the, the potential of mitigation of land degradation because the land yes. in that region is highly degraded and uh, also it has the potential to reduce emissions or to, to sequester carbon from the atmosphere and also uh, make the farmers not to release carbon at, at the same time. And this project also has adaptation because we promote uh, technologies that en enable farmers to adapt to climate vari variability, uh, technologies like terraces or water retention uh, or residue management, uh, mulching, composting, such a technologies that make uh, the area have more vegetation cover at the same time uh, protect soil from erosion and uh, enhance carbon within the soil. And also we promote agroforestry, which uh, increases uh, uh, tree carbon in the landscape. 
And we had, what we have learned that uh, this project uh, can save space and also secure food because it has multifunctionality. Uh, the agroforest itself has ecosystem services. It, it shows that when you do agroforest, you experience high productivity. And then you, you, you enhance food security. And then there's the issue of sustainability and resilience landscape. You realize that this area is bare. And uh, if you look at the water bodies are actually uh, what I learned that water should be colorless. But when you come to this area, the water is not colorless. So it's highly degraded. And then, uh, like from ICRAF study, they say that for every one hectare put under agroforestry uh, alternatives, five to ten hectares can be saved. That's a, a report that is there. And then the issue of diversification of a farming system that we, we, we promote is very important uh, to, to enhance the production up to, to meet the market. And, uh, those are actually that uh, what we learned in carbon, uh, a Kenya Agricultural Carbon Project, uh, save space and also secure food security of smallholder uh, farmers. And then in this project, we have a holistic approach whereby we promote technologies which we call sustainable agriculture land management, uh, making them attractive, financially attractive. We, we promote a concept called farm enterprise development. Uh, where farmers select an enterprise and then promote those technologies, the management of the, the, the cropland. And then uh, for farmers to have fun, finance, the, 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 the groups that we, we work with these technologies, they, pro, they, 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 they mobilize funds themselves, which we call village saving and loaning, whereby these groups uh, save some money, then they they get, they, they, they can loan one another, and then at the end of the year they get a dividend which they can invest back to these technologies. And then from the experience for the farmers who have, uh, like uh, we have worked with the 20,000 farmers, we have learned from the database that they have increased uh, uh, food security from 15 to 30 percent. And then uh, those are years from 2009 to 2011. Uh, and then the average number of trees on the cropland, which was not there, uh, we have seen the trees on now on agricultural landscape, which is increasing. And then on methodology, uh, we have a, a methodology that we, de we developed uh, with the biocarbon fund supports and the unique forestry. They finance this methodology, and uh, the methodology is called Adoption of Sustainable Agricultural Land Management. And this methodology, what we are learning, is generic and can be scaled up. It's model approach with activity-based monitoring. And uh, we don't do direct measurements. Because when you do uh, activity-based monitoring, you save like four to five uh, uh, costs. So it's cheaper when you do uh, soil uh, carbon modeling. Then the long-term research is Kenya also confirms the model is applicable. And the, those non-soil modules like agroforestry, tree carbon, we use CDM and other methodologies already in place. So the methodology was, uh, was submitted to VCS. And then on precision of the data, we use a database and then we, we also use GIS uh, model-based and to visualize to have farm polygon on the farm. So major conclusion of this project, of, on this project and recommendation that uh, this project shows that carbon payment can be well integrated into pro projects promoting sustainable agriculture development. Extension and uh, advisory services are a prerequisite for successful implementation and it needs more attention and financing. So bottom up and participatory approaches gives best results. Carbon finance will leverage climate smart agriculture. Training and capacity building for projects and it is essential. And uh, we need to match the adaptation and mitigation uh, financing. And then we combine financing from public and private sources. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amos.